First thing to tell you is that what we've done today is classical futurism. The first church fathers, that's beyond the New Testament time, right? The thesis behind our talks, which have been really quite united, I think, in saying the same sort of thing. The thesis is this, that when the apostles died, the leadership in the church went from Jews to Gentiles. The leaders in the New Testament church were Jews, weren't they? How many people wrote the New Testament? Eight or nine, Hebrews, not by Paul, probably. Let's say eight or nine. How many were Jews? All of them except probably who? Luke, who wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else, exclude Hebrews from So massive amount. But they're Jewish. They're frightfully Jewish. Because Messiah is a Jewish concept, is it not? If you're the Messiah, what are you going to do eventually? Rule the world. This is the answer to jihadism. You see that? The ideology of the Quran is, we are going to rule the world. And we'll kill you if you don't like it. <laughs> Jesus has an answer to that. And you are that answer to it. So by no means must we give our identity away to an unconverted Jew. That is Hagee's, Hagee or Hagee's Zionism. Jesus said, our fellow Jews, they're of the devil. He didn't say you're good boys because you're Jews. You have to believe in Messiah to be a true Jew. Is that right? And you're those Gentiles who came in and are subscribing to the Messianic idea. And you are God's people. You're his special treasure. So you stick on your refrigerator the text in Exodus 19 where it says, you are royal priests, your priesthood, special treasure, your kings and priests. Guess what? That text was given to Israel. Go over to 1 Peter 2, read it carefully, put it on the fridge. It says, you are the special <coughs> treasure of God. That's a high privilege, isn't it? So we should all rejoice in the fact that God has chosen us to be his choice people. Should we put it that way? Not that we're anything. I see that. But it does say, well done, Tom. You did good. Take charge of five, ten cities. you notice that? Oh, no. Well done, Jesus. You get my point? We've got this slightly out of balance. God can do amazing things with our talent. Of course, as Dr. Jude reminds us, we're dreaming with God. We're, doing, we're joining God. But don't underestimate what you can do with the talent that you have. So that's, that's one of the thoughts. Now, what have we done today? My first topic, I think, was to do with the tribulation and the kingdom, or kingdom and tribulation, something like that. The point was a very simple one. I don't know if you gathered it. Don't throw rocks at me. Jesus will not come back tonight. Dangerous in some audiences. Dangerous. Oh, you won't believe it. <laughs> You're not everything God. You're putting God in the box. What if God put himself in his own box? Just think about that. Jesus will not come back tonight. Now, you know, if I'm exposed as a false prophet, I'll, I'll, I'll fall on my knees and beg for mercy. Because Jesus was asked the question, what will be the sign of your, what's the Greek word there? Parousia. And in the same breath, the end of the age. It ain't that difficult. They're looking at the temple buildings out there, and they know from prophecy that those temple buildings have to be demolished, destroyed, interfered with in some big way. They know that from Daniel, by the way. They knew that. And so they naturally look at those buildings and they say, and Jesus in fact says, there won't be a stone here that's going to remain. It's all going to tumble down and be interfered with. But he didn't know himself, probably, that it would be 2,000 years away. All he knows is that there's going to be trouble in the temple connected with the arrival of the king. He knows that from Daniel. Isn't that easy? And you say, well, wait a minute, let's talk about those buildings there. Not some building in the future. Now you're thinking like a Westerner. The Hebrew mind grasps a totality. If you look in the book of Haggai, you'll, say that the, you'll see that the temple that used to be there is called this temple. The temple is there that is there right then is also this temple, and the <coughs> temple that's yet unbuilt in the future in, in, in the kingdom is still this temple. You got the idea? So you can say, this temple, it might be 15 more temples here. I don't think so. But it's very easy once you grasp that. So Matthew 24 is very clear. What will be the sign of your coming, the parousia, and the end of the age? The end of the age. The end of the age. Theologians are busy with their lying pens writing about the end of time. Do you want to be beyond time? No, I don't think Impossible. so. You know, you take, throw your watch away, and you're not beyond time. I don't think so. The devil is very clever. He's gotten the churches to believe in an impossible goal. If you are good, and don't kick the cat, and you're kind to Aunt Bessie, and a jolly good chap theology, this is jo it's very British, jolly good chap theology, <coughs> then when you die, you're going to go off and play the harp on a pink cloud. Oh, I think, how awfully boring. I'd rather stay around and 
do the things we enjoy doing. That's clever. The devil is very clever. There is a devil externally. There is a devil, ex there is a devil externally, I want to tell you. <laughs> Don't please adopt the idea that there's no devil, that you're the devil. That's not psychologically very good. <laughs> but it also <laughs> makes you look very strange. I say this with all kindness to our Christadelphian friends. You say, well, well, I believe in these marvelous truths about the one God, and Jesus is the human Jesus, you know, the human Messiah. And now I'm going to tell you, you're the devil. But wait a minute. That's a stretch. You know it says that in the wilderness, the devil, the Greek is prosethon, came up to him from outside. So Terry walks up towards me and I say, I am Terry. No, that doesn't make any sense. That sounds awfully wacko. I want to put this on record. It just doesn't sound right. So you get on your knees and you beg God for truth at all costs. I hope I'm not poisoning my system with idiot, idiot ideas that are going to make people shy away from the faith, try to get it right. So if there's a devil, then he's very tricky, and so he had me, as a Church of England boy, believing in nonsense. And I tried to read the New Testament very hard when I was 13, 14, at boarding school. We were all sent off to boarding school at the age of eight for the rest of our careers. Not a good idea, but like that now. But here I'm trying to read the New Testament. I got bogged down about Matthew 1, verse 10. I didn't know what the word begat meant anyway. And I was given the good old King James Bible, because it's good enough for Jesus, it must be good enough for me. Amen. 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 <laughs> I've learned a bit of something about it from Americans. I love the humor, it's very funny. Yeah, so good enough for Paul, I mean, come on. Jesus, we know, spoke King James English, don't we? That is wacko, don't say it. It makes you look so strange. Don't do it, take my advice. Move forward into the NSV or the NIV or something like that. Join the real world. I now know that the word beget means to bring into existence. I didn't know that. I've learned a bit in the last 50 years. Yenao in Greek means to give existence to. Guess what? Mary had a baby. And that baby came into existence. Luke couldn't have said it more clearly. Matthew said the same thing. He talks about the genesis of Jesus. It's a new genesis. All this is clear to me now, but we had to have kind Christadelphians come and tell us this. Because we didn't know this. And our, let me tell you this, our immediate reaction was resistance. The leader of the whole Christadelphian movement in Watford, England, where we, Barbara and I were married by this time, back in 1972 or 4, 73 or 4, the troubleshooters of the whole Christadelphian movement came to our house because we believed in the kingdom at this point and we had that in common with them. Everybody else kicked us out because we didn't believe in going to heaven. They said, no, you're right, sleep with it. Actually, the day it, it's my Georgian now, the day it are really day it. <laughs> you get that? The dead are really dead. I say in my boring way, the day it are really day it. We got that right. We understood that. And Christopher said, amen, they said. Actually, they don't get that charismatic, they said. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but they said, Anthony, listen, you've got this wrong. There's no God the Son in the Bible. I said, what? <laughs> and then we said, God had beaten us down, and we suffered through the Armstrong movement so, so severely that we were ready to learn. Sometimes we have to be made ready to learn. And so I said, teach us, we've been wrong on many things. And they explained that, no, the Son of God is the result of Luke 135. It's the big time refrigerator verse for all your neighbors. We talk about it constantly at the bank, everywhere, Luke 135, which says precisely because of the miracle in her womb, this person will be the Son of God. Isn't that easy? Do you need an army of the theologians to argue about? No. That's wonderful. Mary had a baby. That was not Mr. and Mrs. Christ had Jesus Christ. It was Joseph, the legal parent, of course. God was his father. Quran doesn't understand that. It says God cannot have a father, and yet says Joseph was not his father. Figure that one out. Is that difficult? Can you imagine having to lecture on that? That's a few billion of your friends out there who need you to explain to them, yes, God, it's the father of Jesus by miracle. They actually believe in, in the virginal begetting. They do. But God cannot have a son. Of course, Jesus didn't die in the Quran. That's problematic. Well, no, Jesus didn't die because God wouldn't allow any of his prophets to die, so that couldn't be right, they say. Then who died on the cross? Well, that was Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross. Or well, if you don't buy that, it was Judas. God put the face of, I can't even say it, Jesus, the face of Judas on Jesus or Jesus on... Uh, You've got work to do, you guys. Are you concerned with that billion Quranic people? They need your help. Anyway, so we came through that Christadelphian experience. The lesson is, I think, for all of us, that sometimes God has to push you down a bit before you're willing to listen. 
So we listened to that kind of God stuff, and I said, well, wait a minute. I can remember being on the phone. You remember these vivid moments in your life? I was on the phone with this dear Christadelphian man. I said, wait a minute. It says the rock that followed them was Christ. Come on now. There's that rock, walking along. He said, oh, no. That is typology. That is typological language. I said, that is playing the way. That is me. But God was dealing with us. And we said, my goodness, <coughs> that language makes a lot of sense. Because it says they were baptized in the Red Sea. Baptized, not quite literally. It also says they were baptized in a cloud. So let's baptize everybody in clouds. Should we do that? <laughs> you see how bad we were? I want to tell you, church is not a good place to learn the Bible. We didn't learn it. <laughs> if you can get these people out of the church, that's God had to do with us, then you can teach them. And now I think that's a beautiful truth that Mary had a baby by miracle. And for that reason, precisely, Viocengri, precisely because of the miracle wrought in her, and that's the way to put it, that child will be the begotten child, the child coming into existence we call the Son of God. Isn't that marvelous? We had to traipse across the earth to find you guys. Do you realize that? <laughs> we had to find our theology on about five or six basic truths. Kingdom of God coming, sleep of the dead, that's called conditional immortality, but God is not going to torture the wicked forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's an unspeakable idea to me. You have a child that lights a match under a spider's leg. Would you put up with their child doing that? Holding a match under a spider's leg? No, you'd stop that child. Of oh, but the God of all compassion and love is going to torture the wicked forever and ever and ever. That's blasphemous, isn't it? We've learned that. So with that truth, conditional immortality, sleep of the dead, uh, the no eternal fire, with the amazing truth that Jesus is the Son of God, not God the Son. <coughs> what else? That on the, on the whole, think about this deeply, nonviolence might be a good idea. Before you kill a lot of other Christians, at least pause. Give it some thought. I know that's politically charged. I understand that. Difficult, difficult area. But give it some thought. With those truths in mind, okay, now where do we go to church exactly? Because some people have said to us, well, don't have churches in England? Ain't you all got churches in England? <laughs> in my attempt at bad Georgian, I do it so badly. It tortures me every time I try. But yes, we do have churches. We have the Baptist Church. We have the C of E Church of England. It's been there forever. Red carpet treatment. They bring you a loaf of bread the first week you show up in church. <laughs> then you get a 10-minute sermon on going to heaven when you die. <laughs> so we couldn't go there. <coughs> we went to the Christadelphians. They believe in the kingdom. Sleep of the dead. Great. We believe in the devil externally. After two years of discussion on that one, and they said, Anthony, you're right. No fellowship. Can't have communion. So we tried the Plymouth Brethren. <laughs> that story is very, very simple. The Plymouth Brethren said, during the communion service, which they had in our house, we had used to do it in our house, and these dear Plymouth Brethren, brethren what was their name? Mr. and Mrs., you remember the name? I remember. Right in the middle, they discovered that we were not Trinis. We were not Trinis. They walked out in the middle of the community service. Literally. They did. They got up, blessed their hearts. That was their conviction. I respect that. Now we said, well, this is awful. Are we, Barbara's, Barbara's a very meek and mild, you know, I mean, very, very sort of inoffensive, mild sort of person. We weren't troublemakers. But where do you go to church? Well, we tried the charismatic church. Well, they were always intense, and they were always trying to push us over backwards. <laughs> I couldn't get that. Now, one of the local Bishop Pitches had had his teeth filled miraculously by getting cold teeth. He did. Well, this, this is attractive. Now I find a church I can really join. Uh, but then we'd be in this white tent, and they'd be praying for us and pushing us backwards, and then there would be a catcher behind. And I thought, if the Holy Spirit is trying to push him backwards, why are we trying to prevent that? Why are we trying to catch people when they're supposed to? It doesn't make any sense to me. So my suggestion to you, and I messed up on some terms here, but if you're going to claim the gift of languages, because in Acts 2 they spoke foreign languages unlearned. That's what it says. The miracle was not in the ears of the people, is it? The miracle was in the apostles. That makes sense, doesn't it? They actually spoke foreign languages unlearned. I'm suggesting, don't have to believe what I say, check it out. But that makes good sense to me. God was doing a sort of reversal of the Tower of Babel exercise. That's marvelous. Now, if you speak to me in German, let's say somebody here at this table, if you speak to me in German now, which I do know, and I don't think you probably know, I don't think Tom knows German. 
I believe it. It's a miracle. I said this in Minnesota the other day. There was a man sitting at the table saying, have you speak to me in German? I do. And he spoke to me in fluent German. He <laughs> <laughs> got a sense of humor. He lived in Germany. That's a miracle. If Terry regularly pulls people out of wheelchairs, Paul went on the island of Malta and healed the whole lot, didn't he? Right, Peter's mother-in-law got high fever. What was her temperature? 105. No problem. Come on, Jesus. Takes her by the hand, and she's cooking supper. I don't see that happening today. I wish it would. It would be delightful. But things are not quite like that. So with that, then the charismatic thing failed us. We just couldn't quite get on. <laughs> Some of the visionary experiences that people had were amazing. There was a vision about coat hangers, wasn't there, Bob? Remember? Red. Red coat hangers. <laughs> so what do you do? Baptist church? Well, there aren't really any Baptist churches, very few. Church of England, red carpet treatment, jolly good chap theology, charismatics pushing you over, gold teeth being filled, glitter in the hair, supernaturally. So now you say, we said to God, what can we do for the rest of our careers? I gave up a nice job at your American school where they were paying us American rates in Britain, which is very generous. Your school for all your oil magnets and your ambassadors, and it was, it was fun. But being a language teacher, <laughs> I got switched off when the Texas boy with a big hat on, his feet on the desk in front, said to me, Banjur, Monsieur Buzzard. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually Bonjour, Monsieur Bizarre. <laughs> Banjur, Monsieur Buzzard. I thought, my days are through. <laughs> Teaching languages is hard work for teenagers. And everybody speaks American and British anyway. So. We, we gave up, and we tried then the theological exercise. Well, where do you go to church? And we didn't know about you guys, because you were hidden in a cornfield in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't very promising. <laughs> so we came to the States. I mean, our life is very simple. I, th I think there's a point in this. This is, this is a typical way God can deal with you. And we said, well, now, is there anybody around even like the Christadelphians? Because we knew they believed in the kingdom and so on. They said, well, there is this strange thing. It's something like Abraham's church. We're not sure exactly. I said, give me that phone number. <laughs> give me that phone number. And Russ McGaw was the editor of the magazine at that point. Got him on the phone. I said, Russ. And he said, I'm the editor of the magazine. I said, I'm, I'm a visitor from looking for a church. He said, do you believe in the devil? Yes. And we were home. We were home. You see that? Here were 200 people who believed that the, the dead were dead. As per Daniel 12, verse 2, then you're sleeping in the dust of the ground, some will rise to the life of the age to come. Isn't that easy? 200 people in the building believed all that. That's amazing. Gordon Landry was among them, probably. Met him very early on. Such a gentle person. Believed in all these truths. So we were home, and that's our, that's our career. It's not, it's not very exciting in the sense that it's rather simple, but then 35 years later, retired from the college, let's go once a, a week. Internet's changed everything for us because now you can speak potentially in 280 languages using the Google app now. We can put all of our stuff into 280 languages. It's, a machine cannot translate well, but that's amazing, isn't it? So what else makes any sense? If there isn't a kingdom coming, we're in bad trouble. I think that Jesus and you are the answer to ISIS. What else is? If you would like to stay uh, for a few minutes when we finish, let's keep this very short. Carlos has a little presentation after this on the burning of Cervetes. Miguel Cervetes was a Spanish, brilliant, a doctor, geographer, a very brilliant young fellow who guessed, he, guess what? He discovered that Jesus isn't God. Horror of horrors, Jesus isn't God. He paid with his life for that. I want you to see the little movie that, that Carlos put together. It's very, it's very touching. If, and awful in the fact that Calvinists, who are terrifying people often, are mocking the death of your brother Cervetus on this issue. It's selling. So it's a hard, tough world. Back to my an initial point then. Jesus will not come back tonight. So when asked what's the sign of your coming and the end of the age, your Bible study technique is to say, what's the end of the age mean? You go to Matthew 13, it says, your face is going to shine like the sun in its strength at the end of the age. The harvest is the end of the age. That's two. Matthew 24, what's the sign of your coming at the end of the age? That's three. 
And then there's one in the Great Commission. I will be with you until the end of the age. Is that hard? Is that the way you do your Bible study? You string the pearls together, as Kathy was saying. You join the dots. So the end of the age is the end of the age. It's not 70 AD. The devil is very clever at ruining your hope. How do you get rid of hope? You put it in the past, for goodness sake. Put it behind you. You put your hope behind you. You have no hope, and you're hopeless. So a lot of preterizing, particularly in the Church of Christ, with great respect to them, they said everything is spiritual. When it says that Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David, in that wonderful announcement by Gabriel, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. Isn't that marvelous? That is pure messianism. <coughs> and the Gentile organized church that's in post-biblical time, back to our thesis, right? Change of hands to, from Jews to Gentiles. They didn't get it. They said, oh no, we can't have anything as messianic and Jewish as that. It's anti-Semitic like Luther. Luther, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but the earlier Martin Luther said, effectively burn the synagogue. Stop the rabbis. People don't know that. Actually, people don't know much about anything, right? <laughs> Church is the area where you don't know nothing about nothing. That's a disaster. Church is where you need to know. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's in Isaiah 5 and also in Hosea 6, twice. Destroyed. Did you get that? Destroyed for lack of knowledge. Oh, here's a verse that isn't a refrigerated verse. Isaiah 53, 11 says, My righteous servant, referring to Jesus, Isaiah 53, 11, along with Hosea 6, 4 and Isaiah 5, <coughs> Excuse me, it says, Isaiah 53 11. Why isn't this a John 3 16? I want to know. Why is John 3 16 so popular and this one isn't? What does Isaiah 53 None of you know it. Maybe. What does Isaiah 53 11 say? Teachers always know they still have a job when you don't know the answers, by the way. It's a great relief. If you all say, well, come on, tell us something you don't know. You don't know that verse. Why not? There are only 38,000 verses in, in the New Testament, in the, in the Bible. <coughs> anyway, Isaiah 53, 11 says, My righteous servant, referring to Jesus, is going to make many righteous. Yes, make them right rather than wrong. How? By his, next word? We've got a verse we don't know here. Suffering. Ah, that's what they might think. <coughs> By his knowledge. Oh, heaven forbid that awful thing, head knowledge. Oh, the devil's very good at saying, it's all in the heart, Anthony. Get warm, warm up. Stop this terrible intellectual nonsense. This is the propaganda of the devil, as far as I can see. By his knowledge. Put that on your bridge, would you? Isn't that brilliant? Jesus was a rabbi. So John 13, 13 says, you call me... Rabbi and Lord, thank you. <coughs> you call me Rabbi and Lord. And then he said, how does that verse go? You call me Rabbi and Lord, thank you. How does that verse go on? <coughs> you're doing badly? No, you're doing well. <coughs> you call my, me Rabbi, Jesus said, and Lord, and you're doing good. In Georgia, you're done good. <coughs> Are you hearing those verses preached? I, I ask you to evaluate carefully. Are you hearing Isaiah 53, 11? By his knowledge, he's going to make you right. You're not wrong. You're right now. You're right through the obedience of faith. You're doing what Jesus says, and you're doing it in faith. The obedience of faith, the obedience of faith. The obedience. Isn't that easy? We've made this so difficult. So I love the obedience of faith. That's in the beginning of Romans and the end of Romans. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will make many right. It isn't that God's going to kill himself. Well, Jesus is right. And look, at I'll pretend you are. No, no. You are right rather than wrong. If you believe in the Abrahamic promises, and you're living the life, of course. That's not so hard. Theology's become a nightmare. Okay, so supposing Jesus will not come back tonight, but he will come back when then? The question was, what will be the sign of your coming, or part of see in the end of the age? So you look up end of the age, and then you find that in five places in Matthew, that's what it means, not 70 AD. But a whole lot of very intelligent people, no more or less intelligent than you guys, would fight me, fight us on that point. 70 AD was it. Jerusalem was destroyed. That was the end of the age and the kingdom of God came. That's not what you believe, is it? You're shaking your head. Why? Why aren't you a good Church of Christ person? That they <laughs> told me it's taking to be persecuted here. <laughs> I know you. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. So 
I believe we have that right. Jesus is coming back and he's going to fix the world, run the world, with your help. All right, so you say to people, do you want to be like Jesus? Oh, yes, I want to be like Jesus. And what they mean is I want to be sweet and kind and loving, and all of that's good. I want my language to be controlled. I want to be, have a good marriage. The sex belongs strictly within the next. That's a rocket science idea, isn't it? You don't have babies floating around, with, I mean, floating around babies around when you haven't got a nest. Just, just wait to have it. Oh, there, I get it. In your kingdom, that's going to be the rule. And that's the rule for us now. I see that. So the idea then is that Jesus will come back and he will use your talent to assist him in fixing the world. And I, I've heard over the years in the church, but I'm not trying to be hard on anybody, because we, we start by knowing nothing more. Well, who are we going to rule over? Wait a minute. What? <laughs> what did Jesus say? I will give you power over the... Nations. Got it? Now it says nations. I'm, I'm very cheeky in, in, in class. It's, shut up, sit down, and get on the line. Right, that's the answer. Remember Zechariah was struck down for not believing what the angel said? You're supposed to believe what it says. You and you and you are going to be given exousia, authority, over the nations to rule them with a rod of... Oh! You love that verse? Why are you just doing John 3.16 and not that verse? What's this uh, Pollyanna approach, you know, this hopping around approach, cherry-picking approach to Scripture? Are you reading 38,000 verses of the Bible regularly, or have you never even read that one? That's an amazing thing. He says in Revelation 2, 26, 27, to you who overcome, you have to persist to the end. There's another doctrine, the not once saved, always saved thing, what Sean Finnegan nicely calls no sass, not once saved, always saved. Unlike the Billy Graham idea, that once you put up your hand to get saved, it wouldn't matter if you robbed a bank every day of the week for the rest of your your career, so go to heaven play a harp and think that. That's false. That's got to be false. Who would go to the Olympic Games if everybody got a gold medal when the gun goes off? I don't think so. This is much more exciting. You were saved in the past, yes. You are being saved. This should be regular stuff that you teach everywhere, and you're much, actually more frequently, you're going to be saved. You aren't saved fully yet. That actually makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So there in Revelation 2, 26, 27, quoting Psalm 2, the Messianic Psalm 2, which is alluded to no less than five times in the book of Revelation. Jesus loved these, these Psalms, the Messianic Psalm 2. It says, if you overcome, I will give you power over the nations to rule them with a rod of iron, just as my Father gave that power to me. Je Whoa, you want to be like Jesus? You see where I'm going with that? I'm exaggerating my point to try to get it across. So we need not to diminish what God wants to do with us and hang our heads and say, well, if I can just squeeze in there, you know, I can't and No, don't do that. God is more excited about your talent, perhaps, than you are. That's, that's the idea. Okay, if he's not coming back then tonight, he doesn't come back until a very clear sign. So in Matthew 24, 14, it does say, and you know this word, this gospel about the kingdom will be shared is all right, it's a little tame, <laughs> heralded, blasted out, right? Heralded by all means possible in the entire world. It's a town crier word in Greek. Kiriso is to get a trumpet and go, y'all listen, right? It's not, well, may I just smile at you and share? No, no, that's all right too, but you see what I'm going with. It's a very strong word. And it does say, in one of those books, it says, do evangelism, if necessary, use words. Mm, uh, I don't think so. Yes, it's nice to smile at people. I see that. Just be kind and, and kind to everybody. That's wonderful. But eventually you're going to have to give this gospel out. And it's this gospel about the kingdom. Watch out for the NIV, which says that Jesus preached the gospel, but Paul preached the... the sorry, I'll wait around. The NIV says Jesus preached the good news, but Paul preached the gospel. That's a lie. You see what they're doing? Pitting Jesus against Paul. Then you get to ultra-dispensationalism, which some people were taught, which is that the late letters of Paul are the gospel. That's it. You couldn't get systematically more, more devastating than that. If the teaching of Jesus is not the faith, 
I suggest we forget it. So you teach the children all the time, if anybody comes to you and doesn't bring the sound, health-giving, health-giving words of Jesus, forget it. He's lying to you. If somebody comes to you and doesn't repeat the words of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom, watch out, you're being scammed, you see. So I, that's what I like about this system of faith that you, you guys have been taught. It's easy. All right, so then Jesus says, here's how it's going to go. The very first thing is don't get scammed. Give me your synonyms for scam. Hoodwinked, taken in, fooled, etc. The, the kids, the students, you know, come up with wonderful synonyms. Have you got any more for me there? He's a linguist, this guy. No. Scammed, hoodwinked, taken in, fooled. Gone. What is it? Gone. Gone. Okay. Deceived. Deceased. Deceased. How much of a warning is that? Do not be deceived. Don't believe what I say, check it out. People going to church and not the head. It all sounds good. The problem is they're all saying different things. There are people in, in Roman Catholic churches who are quite convinced that Mary's in heaven. And you light candles to her. And the others say that's not true. There are people who believe that God has several wives. So we interviewed them at, at Lima Airport the other day. Young chap, he's 18, elder, elder so and so. He's 18 years old. I said, I do some writing on this subject. May I just ask you a question or two? I said, how do you know that God has several wives? How do you know that? Young kid. Right? He said, well, you know, God has quadrillions of children, doesn't he? <laughs> so guess what? How many wives would you need for that? Are you concerned with this man? Are you going to write him off? No. Go after him. That's not a good thing to believe. Jesus might say to you, how dare you teach stuff like that? Don't do it. Stop it. Get to him. I don't think we're quite as tough on false, quote, doctrine <laughs> as, as Paul really was. It's an error to, to put poison in the system. So if you take the dear Seventh-day Adventist people, we went to their meeting, we heard them say that they now are good trinities. They used not to be Trinitarians, but now they believe in the triune God. And so then they wrote a famous article which says one plus one plus one is one. That's the keystone of our theology. I'm saying, ooh, is it agonizing? That should pain you. They have Bible colleges all around the world. They're beautiful people in many ways. So I think we need to sound like Jesus. That doesn't sound like Jesus to me. Or the Jehovah's Witnesses who suffered so terribly from being apostatized if they dare block the system. So we're getting our kicks out of the internet where people are phoning us every, every month or so. And they've been to Dan Gill's large site, one of the Abrahamic sites, and they're saying, this is wonderful. Roman Catholics, who were training to be nuns, will say, the nun teacher was drawing the immortal soul on the blackboard for me. Hmm. And it wasn't getting through to me, just a kid of 12. I wasn't understanding. The, 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 the nun was drawing the Trinity for me on the blackboard. I wasn't getting it. And then I've been a Jehovah's Witness. I've, been, I've tried this and I've tried Mormonism. I've tried this. And now, wait a minute. This actually makes a lot of sense. God is one. Jesus is the Messiah. So that's our story. Okay, concluding then the, the Matthew 24 thing. What did Jesus say about the end of the age? Wars and rumors of wars. A bit vague. We've had that forever, haven't we? It's not entirely clear. Uh, I thought there were lots of wars in the 1914s, 18s. I lived in the time of the Second World War. We were being bombed by doodlebugs. That's an unmanned bomb. So as kids then, when we were out on our bikes riding, if we heard this ghastly, dismal sound of the warning, mm, it was up and down, I've forgotten, was it straight or up and down, I've forgotten which it was, it was an eerie sound. We were to leap off our bicycles and jump into the ditch, and we did. We slept in a Morrison shelter in our house. Grandmother slept in the where the fireplace was, because if the house falls down, that's likely to survive. <laughs> she might survive. And my brother and I were in a Morrison shelter, a steel contraption. If the house fell down, we would still probably survive. That was war. Was that the wars and rumors of wars? I don't know. I wasn't reading the Bible then, but it isn't clear. What else did Jesus say? Beware of false prophets all the time, right? Who come to you in sheep's clothing. Oh, they're as nice as anything. Everybody's nice, by the way. You know that. Do you know everybody's nice? Everybody's nice. Very few people are just deliberately nasty. They're all very nice. But where? What's out? They're coming to you as sheep. You could have false brothers. You can have false brothers. You could. Now we have to be very careful how to judge that. I see that. But don't get scammed. Keep thinking. Don't get scammed. Then he says, this gospel of the kingdom has to be preached in the whole economy. And then the end will come. 
You don't think that's 70 AD, do you? Hardly. There's only one end in that chapter. The end will come. Then what does he say? When you therefore <coughs> see, Paul's partner used to say rightly, when you have the word therefore, you have to see what it is therefore. You see the connection? Then the end will come. The gospel of the kingdom has been preached worldwide, and then the end will come. When you therefore see, you see, that's just the mark of the end. The only clear sign that Jesus gave that we're very close to the end is the appearance of the abomination, which is not abomination. Don't go there. You know, I'm not political because I'm, I'm, I'm a green card guy. I, I don't belong in you. I drive on the wrong side of the road or right side, whatever it is. I pay the same taxes as you do, but I'm a green card person. Delighted and, and privileged to, to live in America. But we don't want to go with abomination. No, stay with me. The abomination of desolation. Spoken of by whom? By Daniel. By Daniel. Daniel is critically important. Don't undermine Daniel for one inch. And we had that nice thing from Mr. Landry. That was, that was so interesting to me. What a, an extraordinary royal visionary he was. Royal family he was. The royal seed. Very bright. Uh, very intelligent. And he has this amazing vision of the whole of world history. Read this about four times every Sunday. I'm exaggerating. Soak yourself in the book of Isaiah. Soak yourself in the book of Daniel. And Jesus then said, you've got to understand the book of Daniel and the abomination of desolation to get my point here. Brackets, let the reader not get this wrong. Most people get it wrong. They make up their own definition of the abomination of desolation. So you have to look through those, write them all out, and you start perhaps with the later one in 12.11 of Daniel. It says, from the time that the abomination is set up and the daily sacrifice is taken away, there will be 1,290 days. That's slightly over three and a half years. Isn't that fascinating? That's the refrigerator verse. The kids need to learn this. That's very clear. From the time, that's very fixed. From the time that the abomination is set up and the daily sacrifice is removed, there will be 1,290 days to the end of the vision. The end of the vision is the resurrection of the dead. That's fascinating. That's very easy stuff. But we didn't learn this in church. So then the other ones, you know, chapter 8, are about the, the rebellion that causes desolation. It's all the same stuff. There's a wicked guy called the Antichristos, the Antichrist, so mentioned there in John, 1 John uh, 2.18, isn't it? You've heard that Antichristos is coming, the Antichrist. That's opposition by in imitation. Clever way to oppose is to imitate, isn't it? He's pretending to be Christ and he's in fact opposing Christ. So John warned them late in the New Testament period. You've heard that Antichrist, as a single individual, is coming. He can say it was wrong. But let me tell you, there are lots of Antichrists already. You see what's happening? The, fall, the church is falling apart in the, in the days of John the Apostle. So by the time it changes hands in the second century, this is the thesis, not ours, but Harnack and lots of top scholars, the thing has changed. That's why it's so hard for me then, as a Church of England boy, to relate to the Bible well, because the clergy didn't understand this either. And we asked them, well, when do you preach on the second coming? Yeah, it's the one sermon I can't stand doing. I'm supposed to preach on the second coming once a year. No idea what it's about. So then we'd say, well, when do you preach on the Trinity? Oh, my goodness. I have no idea what it's about. These are literal episodes. So something went wrong to make the Bible difficult for people. And I think that our movement from the 1850s, you know, the Abrahamic state, roughly from the 1850s, they're beginning to make sense of stuff that had gotten lost. So we're restorationists. We're saying, let's read the Bible in this Jewish context. That makes perfect sense to me. Maybe I'm just getting senile. Don't have to believe a word I say. I do check it out with Dr. Joe about every week. And he seems to understand this rather well, too. And Jim Madison, of course, was a very special friend of ours. He was quite amazing. So you get the story. What will be the sign of your coming? The end of the age. Wars, rumors, war. Don't get scammed. Don't get taken in. Check it out. Be a brilliant. When you therefore see that the end will come, when you therefore see the A of D standing where he, oh, my key point, he ought not to. Translation is misleading you. It's a person. Standing, linguists love this. There's a participle masculine there. And <coughs> abomination in Greek is neuter. So it ought to have a possible agreeing with it in New Zealand. This is a linguist paradise. Just people who like to play with words. <coughs> in a good sense, I hope. 
No, the text says, and your commentators will bear this out, when you see the abomination of desolation, standing where he, where he, where he, it's a person. Guess what? It's the man of sin in the temple in 2 Thessalonians 2. You got it? Not so hard. When you see this person, I think in a, in a building. The reason for that is when Paul introduces you as temple, either we could say an individual, we could say he's a temple of God, a temple of God, or corporately, you are a temple of God. You see that? But when he speaks of the man sitting in the temple, it's a definite article. There's a place for <coughs> technical studies. Most naturally, one hears a temple, especially when you hear about abomination being some, someone who removes the sacrifice, takes away the daily sacrifice. That seems to scream temple at us. So that's what we're looking for. Until that happens then, and the red heifer and all that, I don't think we can have the end of the age. Meanwhile, we press on. We do what we can to further the gospel of the king. Is that right? We live the kind life, sexual purity being very important. We don't have bunches of rules. We're not measuring sleeves. We've just been in Peru. We're a million strong charismatic group has separated from the assemblies of God over the length of women's sleeves, literally. Now, they're speaking in tongues all together at once, and they're meeting six times a week. But their real issue is how long it, it, you know, is your sleeve. And a number of pastors came out of that, and we met them. Some of them got rebaptized. Good idea. You can wash yourself clean of all that nonsense, start over. And they were so thrilled with the Abrahamic faith. I wish you'd all been there. They were so excited to find that God is one, the kingdom is coming. They just loved it. So there's a world out there terribly confused. Can you do some work on the internet a couple hours a day? Get in and blog with somebody. Go and challenge some Trinitarian. Get in a, in a fight in the best sense. You learn from it. It's fun. Oh, I couldn't do that. There'll be too many. T yes, you can. You can. You can talk to people. I think we have, we owe it to the public. Let me stop at that point. Anything I've said that's really infuriated you? <laughs> it's not my intention. Um, check it out. You check your truth against my error. No, that's the value for it. You check your truth against my error. We can all be wrong. I see that. But as far as I'm concerned, this form of the faith, particularly the prophecy part of it. And don't forget, please, <coughs> Revelation 19, which says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. You ever think of that? The testimony of Jesus. Jesus' testimony is the spirit of prophecy. Notice that Luther, Martin Luther said, Jesus is not preached in the book of Revelation. Wow. <coughs> You're a Lutheran? I wouldn't go there. Calvin, as you're going to see in this movie, who murdered Servetus, your brother. You've seen people burned in cages recently? Have you seen that? You're going to see it again. In prison. There is a vicious hatred against the truth. Believe me. So my dear wife here, who goes to volunteer for the crisis pregnancy people, free work, you know, to help some dear person who's in trouble. Oh, can't sign the Trinitarian state. You're out. Down the south, we're, we're really here to speak. Something's going on here that seems to, to call for a battle, isn't it? Can't explain that. Okay, finish with this then. The text in Daniel 12, verse 2, which says, <clears throat> Many of those who are sleeping in the dust of the ground, you tell the children, you hear what they're doing? They're sleeping. Where are they doing it? In the ground. What are they doing? Sleeping. <sighs> Let's argue about that. Let's not. That's so easy. Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is asleep. I'm going to wait. Isn't that beautiful? You see how beautiful that is? Truth is beautiful. Error is confusion and poison and cyanide in your coffee. Don't go there. Get rid of the errors in your head. You might feel better even. I think it's like health-giving words, of course. All right, so they're going to rise now, I'll finish with this, to the life of the age. In the Hebrew, the chayye, you need an umbrella in the front row when we do Hebrew. A chayye or lam means the life of the age. And the rabbis, as Joe would say, bless their hearts, they were right there. And Jesus, the rabbi, said, if it's the life of the age, the chayye or lam, guess what? It's the life of the age too. You got it? How difficult is that? So quit saying eternal life, if you like it. Bishop right now in his translation has got it right on this point. It's not eternal life. It is eternal life. It is forever. It's a, you know, probably won't get rid of it that easy, but it's awfully vague. 
eternal life for lives for hearts and pink clouds and all that stuff, isn't it? The life of the age to come. Now you sound like Jesus. Oh, I love that. You sound like Jesus. The life of the age to come in which you are going to be immortalized. That seems to me rather huge. When you get as old as I am, and nearly 80 years old, you wonder about these things daily with more interest than you used to. You know, I'd like to chat with Terry for another million years. Wouldn't, you? wouldn't that be fun? That works. We could argue about all sorts of things. <laughs> We're into a huge thing. Not only are you going to get immortality so that you could not be shot dead, you're going to be continuous with yourself in the sense that we're going to know who you are. People say, would we know anybody in the kingdom? Wait a minute. I thought it said, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the king and yourselves being cast out, ghastly thought, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, no. How bad is that? You're going to recognize who you are. Christianity is the only world religion which actually continues you as a person forever. Isn't that precious? And of course, Jesus did say, Touch me, I'm not a spook. I've got flesh and bones. Then people argue about flesh and blood, don't go there. Flesh and bones, so the flesh is God. Yes, he's got flesh. Think about that. Flesh and bones, as you see I have. He's able to walk through the wall and shop. And you're going to rule the world. You ain't seen nothing. I like that George phrase, I learned that. I love that. You ain't seen nothing, <coughs> this is amazing. <coughs> well done, you've done good. Take charge of 10 cities. And you're going to do it with the help of Messiah and have a world where burning people in cages, strapping a bomb on yourself one morning with your husband, walking to a wedding, you see how many people, that's not going to be a bed. You're going to stop that. Isn't that wonderful? I think that's a hope that's worth working towards. Okay? Appreciate your listening so carefully. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. <laughs>